So next to, okay. Yeah, this is tutorial building on the part one of this series. And I think I remember there are three parts. This is the second part. <laughs> uh, so we are solving. So let me do it this way. I'm going to take the uh, thing I wrote before and I'm just going to uh, make the necessary modifications to uh, make it match this question. So this is going to be for question 10. Um, we are solving Schrodinger equation for the same potential as before. Uh, unit is past constant. Ah, we'll solve the Schrodinger equation for instant particles of energy less than the potential barrier. Okay, let me reflect the change here. So now my energy looks something like this. Some energy less than Yuna. Um, we won't repeat the solution for x less than uh, zero region, uh, which remains unchanged. Then the wave function is yeah the sa same thing we had before. Nothing uh, for the negative x region needs to change, so we'll leave those alone. All right. Now refer to part one of this tutorial series for general solutions. Yeah, that have that. What is new now is the general solution for x greater than zero, where the Schrodinger equation is this and now e minus unit is negative so this quantity as a whole is now positive so you have a situation where if you take the two derivatives you will get a positive coefficient times the function back so um so the so in cases like that so um where the differential equation you have is of this form with a positive k the solution that you will get will actually look like this it's gonna be coefficient times um, the real exponential solutions e to the plus kx plus b times e to the minus kx and so there are two potential solutions and that's why the question tells you to find the something examine that you'll find that one of the diverges while the other does not write down below the solution which does not diverge in terms of the parameters given above so looking at this here the solution that does not diverge is the second one because my x goes from zero to infinity so x equals zero both are fine as x goes to infinity only the second term is what does not diverge so i need to so i need to make the first term go to zero and say that this is equal to exponential of and uh this k here is the square root of all of this so let me write it as square root of 2m and i'm gonna swap the order u naught minus e so that it looks manifestly positive, divide by two uh, h bar or h bar squared that was under the square root, so it's outside the square root, so it's no longer squared. Uh, all right, so that's my k and times. Um, oh wait, sorry, it should have the way at my k should have been is k squared. So, <laughs> trying to follow the same convention I was following with the other one. So, okay, there should still be x here. Oh, wait, wait, wait. and I forgot the minus sign. Yeah, minus. So that this looks like an exponential decay. Okay, uh, let me uh, check that that's correct. Because if it's not, then uh, good. Uh, okay. Uh, with above results and results from part one, our general solution to the Schrodinger equation is yeah same as here. Let me uh, change the the parameters here and looks like k two was defined the same way I defined the the capital K there. So let me so here all I have to do is replace plus i with minus k two and it'll be basically what I wrote down. Um, Okay, so that's the general solution. We need to determine the coefficients to find the particular solution. Uh, we apply the same boundary conditions, continuity of the wave function and continuity of the derivative of wave function. So um, applying the boundary condition results in, yeah. At some point, I hope this uh, becomes mechanical. So, um, 
so the first uh, boundary condition i don't think it changes at all when you're plugging in x equals zero then it doesn't quite matter that whether this is complex or real exponential so first the equation doesn't change um, but the second equation changes um, so the left hand side oh, yes okay i think uh, what i did in canceling out the i's that's gonna be no longer valid so let me we write down the second equation carefully so that everything is correct. So again, do it two, doing two things at the same time, I have, uh, I'm taking the derivative of the wave function and then plugging in x equals zero. So uh, derivative of this uh, brings down a factor of i k1. So i k1 times a, and then you plug in x equals zero, you get one. Uh, and then minus i k1 times b, and when you plug in x equals 0, you, you get 1. And now for the right-hand term, derivative here is minus k2, okay, so minus k2 times c, and then when you plug in x equals 0, you get 1 again. Okay, so it looks like really the only thing that changed is this one. Um, so that means um, when I divide up by i k one or sorry, i k one a, um, I need to make sure to write it down correctly. So the left hand side is fine; nothing needs to change it here. And what's changing here is on the right hand side, on the numerator, I should have minus k two. And on the denominator, I should have i k1. Okay, it's a very, very subtle change from what it was before. Um, so now in this question, it looks like the question isn't asking for c over a, but just uh, b over a. Um, so I'm trying to think through if, uh, I think we'll still go through the same steps as before. Because um, even though I don't really need C over A in the end, I think the linear combination here is a more elegant way to kind of get to my answer. So, so I'll just keep the same, more or less the same expressions. I'll just modify the parts that need a modification. So this should be minus K2 over I K1 C over A. So C over A is 2 divided by 1. And really, this minus 1 over i, that when you rationalize it, uh, multiply top and bottom by i, what it ends up being is actually plus i. So let me actually put that here. Um, so it's 1 plus i k2 k1. Yeah, sorry, my eraser's not working all that well. But it, it's 1 plus i k2 over k1. Okay, um, so i my first equation didn't change, so b over a is still c over a minus 1. Now, c over a, what used to be uh, 2 divided by 1 plus k2 over k1 is now 1 plus i k2 over k1. Now, you might ask, what difference does it make? Is it the same? Well, let, let's see. Uh, I'll just uh, work through the algebra and see if there's a difference. So for the one that we are subtracting before, our convenient form of one changes. It's going to be 1 plus i k2 over k1, 1 plus i k2 over k1. So when you take the difference, uh, let me correct the denom denominator here. This is 1 plus i k2 over k1, and numerator 2 minus 1, 1, and then I have minus i k2 okay ah this is i think where things get interesting minus i k2 over k1 yeah so before it looked like this completely real coefficient uh, with um you know uh, numerator that was difference and denominator that was uh sum with these changes, uh, what's the difference is that it looks like it numerators k1 minus i k2, and the denominator is k1 plus i k2. And the special feature here is that 
for all values of k1 and k2, these two coefficients have the same magnitude. You can actually see that. Uh, do this calculation yourself, you know, uh, b over, oh, wait, wait, sorry. Right, do that. <laughs> uh, let me. Let me answer the question that it's asking. B over A. Uh, so the question is minus I K2. So we forgot to start the parenthesis. Divide by K1 plus I K2. So that's the coefficient. It looks uh, like it's a subtle, very subtly different from our previous answer. And the subtle difference actually matters a lot because he says check for yourself that you're well i don't i hope you can see it intuitively but what it says is that this is the case in all cases for all values of k1 and k2 and this is how it's uh, this is intuitively correct when you have a situation like this where incident particle doesn't have enough energy to overcome this barrier you should expect the particle to all bounce back and this result here is saying that it does so that's what i mean is intuitively this result is what you should hope to see now part c the surprising result in this part is that even though the energy is less than you not so um, this barrier represents the uh, the boundary of the classically allowed region and the classically forbidden region. And um, in quantum mechanics, you have non-zero probability of finding particles in the classically forbidden region. So it's uh, asking, find the length L at which the amplitude of the wave function in the region X greater than zero has been Reduced by a uh, <laughs> reduced by a factor of e from initial amplitude c. Oh, I think it's giving us everything here. So we know that the um, the wave function in the positive region is c times e to the minus k two x. Um, so so we are starting from c. So that's good, and. Um, and yeah, so all that this expression is saying is, um, so actually that tells you immediately what the value of L should be in terms of K2. Um, L is one over K2. When X is equal to one over K2, uh, this is gonna be equal to C divided by E. So L is one over K2. Um, in terms of given parameters. Oh, I guess I can answer in terms of K2. I hope one over K2, that's it. Yeah, I hope. Um, yeah, I wonder if uh, this question accepts the long form as well. Um, or uh, I'll check it later. So. You could also, I think, express K2 in terms of all these. And I think all the variables that are defined, there's enough of it that you can actually write out what K2 is. <laughs> I will just check the code to make sure that this question accepts both answers. I mean, this is the simpler form, but I get it if you want to give the longer answer. Um, yeah, and the last question is connected to the idea of quantum tunneling. Okay, uh, let's move on to the next question, question 11. Okay, it says the tutorial is building on parts one and two of this series. Yeah, that's this is the third in the three parts tutorial. This tutorial will only cover the parts that need to change and ask you to recall earlier results. We are solving Schrodinger equation. Oh, yeah. So here the potential is actually stepping down. I think that's a begin of a change that I should start out. Um, well, begin of a change individually that I should start a new question uh, or new space. So this is question number 11. And um, in this question, at x equals 0, 
my potential uh, starting at zero, it drops to the value of uh, minus u naught. And then it continues to be constant at that value. Okay, yeah, where u naught is positive, so the potential energy is negative for values of x greater than zero. A particle traveling to the right would experience an increase in kinetic energy. So if uh, I have a particle of some energy E coming in, the kinetic energy is uh, this difference here. And as it goes across this step down in potential, kinetic energy would increase. The quantum mechanical result you will draw below illustrates how results of wave mechanics contradict or your classical intuition. We won't repeat the result. Yeah, so uh, let me, yeah. So I'll write down that form of the function. Let me get to that part. And for now, let's answer the next part. Um, uh, what is the general solution for x greater than zero, where the Schrodinger equation is this? Oh, I think qualitatively, it's actually same as, so let me write down the solution for region one. So solution for region one is equal to a e to the plus i k one x plus b e to the minus i k one x for x less than zero. And in region two, it's gonna be the basically the same solution, same oscillatory solution, because E plus U naught is positive as E was. So this is gonna be C times E to the plus I K two X, where um, I have to be careful. So X greater than or equal to zero, where I would say K two, this is two, k2 is equal to uh, square root of these coefficients other than minus. So square root of 2m e plus u naught divided by h bar. So exponential of plus i k2 square root of 2m e plus u naught whole thing divided by h bar or h over 2 pi uh, times x. All right, that should be the solution. And again, we are ignoring the leftward traveling solution because we are assuming particles are instant from left. Okay, so with the above result and result from part one, our general solution is this. Now we need to determine coefficients A, B, and C. I hope this is beginning to sound repetitive because it quite is. Applying the boundary condition, we say the wave function is continuous and we say the first derivative of wave function is continuous. So let me write down those equations that you have seen me write down like two previous times. So the um, yeah, applying the boundary conditions results in a system of equations. And k1 and k2 are defined the way I've been, already been using. So let me write this down here. Um, the first boundary condition, the continuity of wave function. So at x equals 0, all these exponentials are just going to be 1. So it'll be a plus b is equal to c. Um, boundary condition number two, the continuity of the derivative. So, oh, this is going to look identical to part one. So let me just finish writing it down. I K one A minus I K one B is equal to I K two C. And again, I's cancel out because it's in every term. And I can simplify both of them this way. Uh, dividing out by a, 1 plus b over a is equal to c over a. And dividing out by k1a, 1 minus b over a is equal to k2 over k1 c over a. All right, the question says solve for the ratio b over a. Oh. But like with before, I think I'm going to 
find it easier to just solve for silver A first because it's just so much easier to come uh, add this to the above equation C B over A cancel out solve for C over A and so so let me just go through that route again um, so adding the two equations I have one plus one to uh, B over A minus one zero is equal to uh, C over A plus K2 over K1 C over A or factoring out C over A 1 plus K2 over K1 C over A. Um, so solving for C over A, I get C over A is equal to 2 divided by 1 plus K2 over K1. I can plug this into the first equation where I've solved for B over A, uh, solving it for B over A, I get B over A is equal to uh, C over A minus 1. So C over A is going to be 2 over 1 plus K2 over K1 minus, let me subtract out the interesting version of uh, 1. So that's going to be 1 plus K2 over K. I think I've done all this before. Nothing algebraically has changed. So let me just finish this and we'll see what has changed. 2 minus 1, that's 1, minus k2 over k1. And the denominator is 1 plus k2 over k1. And I can simplify this a little bit more, multiply top and bottom by k1. I have k1 minus k2 over k1 plus k2 and superficially it might look like nothing has changed from part one and in some sense you're right b over a is really the same value same algebraic expression that it was before this is what has changed in part one i made the remark that b over a is positive take a look here is B over A still positive? I hope you notice that K2 is actually larger than K1. So B over A is actually negative. And uh, yeah, it, it's reflection coefficient, which may be complex or negative, depending on phase shift. And this is the explanation. Negative coefficient represents a pi phase shift. As you can see, to the i pi is equal to minus 1. Um, I think in optics, we gave this effect without proving it. In optics, we told you that um, depending on the chain, direction of change of index or refraction, either the, there's a pi phase shift or there isn't. And uh, this is a, a proof um, showing how in one context, there is a pi phase shift if uh, the potential energy drops. If So what this ends up doing is um, this... Um, so, you know, if we imagine a wave function solution, this drop in potential energy increases kinetic energy and it causes the wavelength to be shorter. And what this result is showing is that if the wave goes from region where it has longer wavelength to shorter wavelength, then, um, then the, the reflected wave experiences a pi phase shift. It's quite analogous to what you have seen in the case of optics. Uh, except in the optics, we didn't bring in quantum mechanics. All right, let's finish it here. B over A squared. Um, oh, I, I think that's just going to be this whole thing squared. Um, I, I don't know. N nothing's going to be any more. I, I, I don't know. We can just take the whole thing and square it. <laughs> um, yeah. That is correct. <laughs> it doesn't really simplify any more than this, so I wouldn't do anything more. Use the result above to answer below qualitative conceptual questions. Which of the following conditions describe a condition when nearly all instant intensity is reflected? That is, B over A squared is greater than or approaches 1. Hmm. So what I would want to happen is... Um, so K2 is always going to be greater than K1 in this scenario. So I would want K1 to be much smaller compared to K2. 
So for that to happen, oh yeah, the potential drop should be as great as possible. So that K1, whatever it is, in comparison to K2, it's much smaller. Yeah. Which of the following conditions describe a condition when nearly no incident intensity is... I think it's intuitively easy to get this. Uh, if a U0 goes to zero, then there's barely any kind of uh, sudden shift here. So it makes sense that less and less will be reflected. And yeah, this is just a closing remark that when you think of this in um, thinking, when you think of this uh, in comparison with wave mechanics, for example, wave optics, then nothing here is actually mysterious. It's uh, quite what you would have expected. Um, the kind of paradoxical result that comes in if you try to think of a classical analog of this. And simple answer here is that there is no classical analog. Classical mechanics is an approximation of quantum mechanics, and it's not it, as with any approximations. It's simply not expected to have usable uh, analogs in all cases because it's not a complete theory.